Hello, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, thank you so much for tuning in to our webinar today. We are talking about a really hot topic today. So I think that our webinar is going to fill up. We're expecting almost 200 people. So I'm very, very happy that everyone's taking a chance to tune in with me and spend time with me for the next hour. So um, today's topic, going with the flow, water levels, and what shapes Lake Huron. So if you aren't familiar with the Coastal Center, we were founded in 1998 with the goals of protecting and restoring Lake Huron's coastal environment and promoting a healthy coastal ecosystem. So we're a non-government, non-profit charitable organization and we rely on the funds that we receive to, our, to hold our programs and then also from donors um, like you. So thank you so much for all of our donors who are tuning in today. Uh, we're able to run beach cleanups, shoreline restoration projects, community workshops and webinars like today, and even our new youth program. So we're very excited to, uh, to be able to share all those with you. Uh, this webinar today is coming to you from our funders, Bruce Power, NWMO, and TD Friends of the Environment Foundation. And these three funders are supporting our Coast Watcher Citizen Science Program and our Green Ribbon Champion uh, Restoration Program. So we're gonna break uh, this webinar down into two sections. We're gonna talk about lake levels and then we're gonna talk about coastal processes and what shapes the lake. So almost probably our, one of our number one questions this year and last year, why is our lake so high? Um, it can basically be broken down into long-term lake fluctuations and short-term fluctuations and changes in shore slope. So as you can see, our one of our founders down there, showing the extent of some um, beach and dune erosion because of the high water levels. So our Great Lakes are an amazing freshwater resource and so they're heavily monitored by both the Canadian and the US cohorts of scientists. Um, there is eight water monitoring stations for lake levels on Lake Huron. As you can see on this map, they're scattered across, uh, in this case, the Canadian side. So they are monitored by NOAA co-ops, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the Canadian Hydrographic Service, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and Environment Climate Change Canada. So a lot of experts coming together to analyze these water levels. Um, so when we're looking at are long-term water fluctuations. Uh, I hear a lot of people say, this is the highest I've ever seen the lake. And for some people it, it might be, it depends on how long you've been living on Lake Huron, but or visiting Lake Huron. So in 2020, up here in the right-hand corner of your screen, right now we're sitting at 177 meters, and that is not above sea level, that's just the, uh, the levels that they use to monitor our Great Lakes. But down here in 2013, we were at 175 meters. So when we talk about being um, one or two meters above average, that sounds very scary. But if you see this red line, that is our average line. So in 2013, we were um, a meter or so below average. So over the course of time, uh, these lake levels go up and down. The last time we had a level this high was the all time high in 1986. And that was 177.5. So when you hear on the news that we're breaking um, monthly highs, that is true, um, but the highest levels are usually in July, August. And uh, so we are going to see how that shapes up in the next few months, I guess, to see if we break the all-time high. A few other Great Lakes um, broke their all-time highs last year. So as you can see, we have a number of all-time highs and they happen uh, approximately every 13 years. So I want to sh uh, call out these days, dates, 1952, 1990, and then 2018. So uh, perception is everything. So if you have been on the lake just for the past 10, 15 years, the, this will be the highest you've ever seen the lake. But if you've been on the lake for 30, 40, 50 years, um, you can see over time, uh, this is the boathouse just outside of my cottage. It was my great grandmother's boathouse. Um, the lake level in 1950 is very similar to what it is uh, right now in 2020. But in 1990, you know, I was a child and I could walk all along the shoreline and carry rocks around. So 
these kind of lake level fluctuations are normal over time. Uh, our lake levels have been monitored for over 100 years. So a relatively short amount of time in the grand scheme of things, but when we look at that long-term perspective, it helps give us some identification whether we should be in a state of concern or not. So another thing we can talk about in relation to lake levels is ice cover. Ice cover has only been tracked on the Great Lakes since 1973 by NOAA, which is the National Oceanic Atmospheric Association Great Lakes Environment Research Laboratory. That's a mouthful. Um, but what they've noticed over this long-term data set is that the average water temperature in Lake Huron throughout the year has increased by approximately um, one degree per decade. So between 1948 and 2008, that average, te the annual temperature in Ontario, like atmospheric temperature, has increased by 1.4 degrees Celsius. Um, and they're projecting another increase by two and a half degrees to three and a half degrees by 2050. So that definitely has effects on our lake ice and also um, our general climate. So when we have a lot of ice cover on our lake, it acts like a Tupperware lid and it holds water in, reducing the amount of evaporation that occurs um, in the wintertime. But if we have not as much ice cover, there's more evaporation, which can lead to more storms and snow, um, especially on, um, in southwestern Ontario. So as you can see in this graph, it varies greatly from year to year, whether we have 25% ice cover or 95% ice cover can change just within a matter of two years. But when we look at the long-term data set, you can see that uh, we are decreasing in ice cover every year. So that just means uh, potentially more uh, intense winter storms, more snow, and a change in climate. So what does this changing water temperature, why, why should we really be concerned about that. I mean, anyone who's swam in Georgian Bay before May 2-4 weekend will know that it might not be a bad thing if our lake warms up a bit. Um, but for long term, this can influence the species dis distributions. Uh, a lot of fish require certain water temperatures in order for their eggs to stay viable, so they might have to move to different places, different plants will start thriving, including invasive species. Um, the increased water surface temperatures can increase water quality concerns, and um, this could be E. coli, it could be algae blooms. So it has wide ranging effects on both humans and, and wildlife. So from a short term perspective, um, water levels can change just based on a storm that's rolling in. So um, if you've ever experienced this, I have once in my life, it was really cool. A storm came rolling in, you know, one of those big header clouds come, comes rolling in, and all of a sudden the water starts creeping up that shoreline, and uh, you know a storm's coming when that happens. And that phenomenon is called a seish. Um, it's, it looks like seishi, but it's pronounced seish. And that short-term lake level rise is caused by wind or an incoming storm. So if you think about it like a glass of water and you're blowing across that glass of water, the water goes up on the opposite side of the glass. Well, that tends to happen on Lake Huron as well. And as you can see in this diagram, most of our storm surges come from the Michigan side. So when we get those seiches come up on, on the Ontario side, you really notice them. Another short-term reason why we might get lake level fluctuations is uh, because of the moon and the gravitational pull that the moon has. So although the Great Lakes don't experience tides per se, there is evidence showing a slight level increase during full moons. Um, and this planetary gravitational pull also brings water, like groundwater, to the surface. Um, and there's a lot of traditional folklore and practices around moon gardening or planting uh, your vegetable gardens at a certain time of year based on when the moon is full or waxing or waning um, and that also coincides with good fishing. So climate change, I would be remiss if I didn't, uh, if I didn't mention climate change and this has short and long-term effects on lake levels. So if you remember that long-term graph, we might, we usually experience um, a high to a low every three to seven years. Um, that might become more frequent or it might become more infrequent. 
uh, we would expect to have a lot more extreme fluctuations. So that means higher highs and lower lows. Um, with these highs and lows, we would experience uh, more erosion on bluffs and beaches and also more damage to our herd and shore structures. And this includes um, municipal infrastructure as well. So climate change can also alter natural habitats um, by removing the amount of vegetation. I know I was speaking to someone there this week who had a number of trees wash off of her bluff because of the high lake level. So that's changing uh, habitat. Coastal wetlands are reliant on, on um, lake level fluctuations. So if we have a low for too long, it can actually impact that ecosystem. Um, higher lake levels on certain shoals and islands can reduce nesting habitat for shorebirds. A lot of herons, uh, gulls, terns, and migratory species rely on these small shoals for protection and uh, nesting and stopover habitat as they make their way um, from south to north in the spring. And then of course, um, with high lake levels, we can have a loss of area for tourism and recreation, like loss of beach, and also damage from built infrastructure. So this picture at the bottom here was a picture from, um, I think the Chantry Island Tour Group. So thank you for that. Um, I think I got that off their Facebook page. So if, if we have high lake levels um, more sporadically, it can affect our coastal infrastructure. So with storm events that occur, so if we're getting more powerful storms, um, this, like I mentioned, increases the demand on our man-made infrastructure and we become more reliant on natural infrastructure like coastal wetlands and vegetative buffers that will be able to um, protect us from the lakes ebbing and flowing. Uh, this means that a lot more places that are too close to the shoreline will be at risk and damage to public and private infrastructure is going to become the norm. And we're already seeing it happen a lot. In 1986, when we had that other lake level peak, uh, they were experiencing a lot of shoreline destruction as well. And that's actually when a lot of the hardened shorelines went in on Lake Huron. So more intense erosion and flooding and added pollution from inland water sources. So as we know, there's a lot of rivers that feed into Lake Huron and if we're having more intense storm events and we don't have the proper infrastructure or natural infrastructure to deal with those inland, all the water and nutrients and sediment ends up getting washed into the lake. And if we have natural infrastructure like coastal wetlands and woodlands farther inland, it helps hold that water back, filter it, and um, make it more pristine to enter Lake Huron. So we wouldn't have as much flashiness in our lake levels, meaning um, different highs and lows and the frequency of those. So communities along Lake Huron know that they need to invest in protection infrastructure. This is, this is no surprise, um, but at what cost? I mean, like I mentioned in a few of our webinars um, that have occurred so far this year, you can engineer the crap out of your shoreline, but it all depends on how much you are willing to pay and how long that hardened shoreline is going to protect you for. So this is a, an article off Facebook from NPR Miami. Um, they need to invest $4.6 billion to protect themselves from tropical storms and hurricanes, which is insane. $4.6 billion is, uh, is nothing to shake a stick at. And when you think about that is the initial investment and then maintenance on that every year. It becomes quite a burden to the municipality. Uh, so that's Miami, you know, they're oceanic. So it's a little different. They're used to tropical storms. But on Lake Huron, that's very much uh, an issue and, and a consideration for our municipalities as well. So these are examples from last October. Example one, uh, Lake, Old Lakeshore Road in Sarnia. They had a bunch of washouts on this road. Um, the lake was very angry. We had a, a great storm and it washed a lot of material out into the lake, including part of the road. They had to shut down part of the road. Um, and Sarnia's capital backlog listed $32 million in needed shoreline protection work. $32 million just to protect, protect the shoreline to keep the road usable. So what we saw in uh, one of our 
coastal community workshops that we held this spring with Sogdean Valley is one of our coastal engineer friends, um, Pete Zuzak, he was talking about uh, Erio in Lake Erie and discussing the different options. And one of the options is just for them to move the road because that's actually cheaper <laughs> to move the infrastructure than to try and harden and protect that infrastructure. I think I just saw a question come in. Connection has been going in and out. Okay, um, I don't know if that's on your end or mine. Um, please let me know if it's happening more often. Um, this example number two is from North Shore Trail uh, in Sogging Shores. So this was actually the, the same storm that affected the old Lakeshore Road. Uh, six kilometers of their North Shore Trail from Port Elgin to Southampton was experiencing high wash-ups of vegetation and gravel um, and full-size tree trunks that were obstructing the roadway. So I'm not sure exactly how long that road had to be closed for in order to um, clear it off and make sure it was safe and that the edge of the road between the lake and the road was stable, but that puts uh, a hindrance on our community as well. Just the time taken to have to shut a road down, reroute people, people who live along that road could possibly be affected. And it actually makes for quite a conundrum if we're talking about emergency response times. So if somebody that lived along this road, if there were people who lived along the road, um, had a heart attack and the ambulances couldn't get to them, that's an issue. So these are all considerations that we have to take into um, account when we are looking at our coastal infrastructure. Uh, this occurrence was last October, 2019. So example three, um, the Goddard Boardwalk and Water Treatment Plant. This one was all over the news around Goddard. Um, so sections of the boardwalk were destroyed and tossed inland. This was a huge, a huge storm again in October. And other sections were buried by rock and sand pushed inland. Um, so they end up the municipality or the town of Godrich ended up deciding they need to replace the entire boardwalk, um, which is gonna cost $900,000 to replace this boardwalk. Now it's a few kilometers long, I think it's one point something kilometers, and they're replacing with 90% wood and 10% cement. And the mayor said that they're not using tax dollars to do this infrastructure, it's the money is coming from different sources, but, um, that's not the case in all municipalities along our coast. Like Lake Huron has over 6,000 kilometers of shoreline and every municipality is different. So as I had mentioned, coastal wetlands need uh, lake level changes. So lake level changes aren't all bad. Um, in the case of coastal wetlands, we need lake level changes to support the different plant communities, the plant life cycles. Some plants require lower lake levels to become emergent, while others um, need lower levels in order to become emergent. They act as fish and amphibian spawning areas, uh, which rely on more shallow areas. And then they're also a nutrient sink for water entering off the landscape. So one thing that I see all the time in response to, um, to media posts that uh, you see come out in the newspaper or on social, uh, on social media is that we need to start controlling these lake levels. Um, we can't have a two meter fluctuation. It's, it's not working for our communities. Um, so what are our options? Uh, and there are a few dams in operation around Lake Huron, but their presence does not drastically impact the natural lake level fluctuation enough. Um, I worked in Algonquin uh, for just over a year, Algonquin Provincial Park, and they have a number of dams that they operate in that park and like a huge network in that whole area. And by operating one dam, one stock block dam, you could uh, potentially impact three more dams or three more lake systems because it's so flashy and it's so um, temperamental. But because Lake Huron's basin is so huge and it's fed from Lake Superior, 
and Lake Michigan, um, it's the dam operations don't have that much impact. So the other option is, sorry, getting this alert that my audio's having trouble. That might be what folks are talking about. Um, the other thing that people bring up occasionally is that uh, there is dredging in the St. Mary's and St. Clair rivers. Um, and studies have shown that this dredging does not have a drastic impact on lake level fluctuations. They just can't dredge enough water out to drain the Great Lakes. Again, the basin is so huge, it wouldn't have as much impact. Um, and there's been a number of studies over the past six decades that have um, supported that dredging. So uh, the IJC, the International Joint Commission, they are the ones that look at um, the dam operation and dredging and, and whatnot. And uh, the, the chair of the IJC, Pierre Balland, he says that uh, we would be humbled to think that we can control the Great Lakes. They are magnificent, but they are wild. So to finish this thought, um, when will they go down? When are lake levels going to recede again? So again, looking back at this, at this chart from just 1950 until now, we look at the, the space between the lows. So we have five years, 13 years, 13 years, 10 years, 13 years. So if we can make an educated guess based on this average, um, possibly 13 years from 2013, so 2026, they would be at a low again. Um, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Association that puts out this data, they only predict six months into the future because lake levels are so ever-changing that it's too uh, and reliant on different storms, different times of year. It's too challenging uh, to make an accurate estimation any farther ahead than six months. So if we look at that more closely, uh, what six months from now holds, uh, these red bars show that we're, they're predicting it to go down slightly um, as we move into the fall. Getting another contribution in our chat. So, sorry, can I, is everyone still here? Okay, I'm gonna try sharing my screen again. Sorry, I don't know what's happening here. There's lots of people on the chat, sorry. I'm just trying to get my presentation back up and running. Okay, great. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, for the water level graphs, what unit is being used? Oh, uh, so 177.44. Um, this is in meters. So it's um, an international Great Lakes water level datum. So they have just decided it's not above sea level. It's just the, the water level meters that they use. And they've, that's what they've been using for the past 102 years. Um, I could get more information on that. I, I've looked it up a hundred times and I just can't remember. I'm not sure if this info is accurate, but I was told by a neighbor that the Asable River was recently dredged and all the sand was tracked away rather than taken back out into the lake. Um, I'm not sure about that. There is a lot of dredging that occurs in the river mouths on Lake Huron, um, but I haven't been up on what's happened this spring. No, not 177 meters from the lake bed. It's, it's just a measurement that they've decided on using. It's just a, the standard datum measurement. Um, it's not above sea level. It's not above the lake bed. It's just um, kind of an arbitrary unit that they've measured against uh, the entire time that they've measured the lake levels. And actually, um, if you go on NOAA's website, they have a whole description on how they came up with that datum and uh, how it was decided upon and, and how they um, track those measurements. Could you comment on the Long Lack and Ogokoi divisions? No, I cannot comment on that. <laughs> um, I'm not familiar enough with this um, uh, uh, in regards to those divisions to make any kind of statement on them. Okay, we'll, we'll keep this wagon train rolling here. 
Okay, so now we're gonna talk about coastal processes. So what is a coastal process? Um, coastal processes are the movement of sediment, vegetation, and water within the near shore zone. Near shore zone is that water uh, that goes from the shoreline, so zero centimeters to six meters deep. Uh, coastal processes consist of waves and wind, which are kind of synonymous with one another, uh, the currents of Lake Huron, littoral drift, erosion, and deposition, and then shoreline profiles and river mouths. So we're gonna talk about all those. I'm just gonna open up the chat again here because I saw a few more questions come in. Ah, Mary Lou, International Great Lakes Database, yeah. Um, thank you for that. I don't know if all the panelists can see this webinar chat, but hopefully, hopefully you can. Okay. So getting just reintroduced to Lake Huron quickly. Um, Lake Huron is 228 meters deep. It's the second deepest lake against uh, Lake Superior. It's almost 60,000 kilometers squared in area and has 6,100 kilometers of length. Like I mentioned before, it's, uh, it has the longest shoreline of all the Great Lakes, including islands. Uh, and then also it has a residence time of 22 years. So what does that mean, <laughs> residence time? Uh, it means that when a drop of water falls into Lake Huron, it will stay in that lake for 22 years, which is pretty amazing. Um, you know, that's most of my lifetime. <laughs> um, so when we talk about the things that enter our lake, like potential pollutants or um, sediment or, um, even the temperature of the lake, that has a long-term effect. Uh, but if you believe it or not, uh, Lake Superior's is almost 100 years. So based on the depth of the lake um, and the size of the lake, this residence time changes. So Lake Huron and Lake Ontario have much different residences time again. Lake Ontario has a much shorter residence time. And I can't remember what that is off the top of my head, just thinking of it, but... Um, but anyway, we'll continue here. Uh, so keeping current, uh, we had a question not too long ago from uh, one of our Coast Watcher volunteers about whether Lake Huron has currents or if they have gyres like they do in the oceans. And technically they don't have gyres, but we do have currents per se. So water enters Lake Huron from the Mackinac Strait at Sault Ste. Marie. It swirls around the Bruce Basin in uh, Georgian Bay, and then it also swirls around uh, the Tobermory and Goddard Basins or the Manitoulin Basin and the Saginaw Bay, and then exits through the St. Clair River at Sarnia. So uh, if you look at how, like why this occurs, when we talk about wind direction on Lake Huron and, and waves, remember when we were talking about seiches and the wind usually coming from Michigan side to Ontario. Uh, this small pie chart down here shows the wind direction that was recorded by Coast Watchers volunteers last year. And they are all along our coast in uh, the southeastern shores and Georgian Bay. So they recorded that uh, almost 70% of the time our wind direction comes from the north or the west. So that also shows how our currents flow or the water flows through Lake Huron. It's constantly flowing down and then e exiting through <laughs> um, basically the St. Lawrence River out into the ocean. So uh, a fun fact, back you know, in, at post-glaciation times when lake levels were a lot lower, Lake Huron was actually divided into three basins. So there was this uh, southern Basin, the Goddard Basin, and then this Alpena to Amberley Ridge separated that from the Manitoulin Basin here, and then the, the Bruce Basin, which is now Georgian Bay, was its own basin. And uh, it actually drained out of the French River, out into the Ottawa River, which flows down into the St. Lawrence. So that's kind of a unique way to think of about our lake and how it changes based on lake levels as well. Littoral drift and a longshore transport. Now these are two terms that I never knew before starting work at the Coastal Center almost four years ago. Um, but it's a very cool um, 
phenomenon that happens on Lake Huron. So when waves hit the shore, it's typically at an angle, and this angle causes the sediment to kind of zigzag through that near shore waters, adding sediment to the beach, taking sediment away from the beach, or in the case of our, uh, of our bedrock shorelines, taking potentially trees away. And then these longshore currents, or you know that, those currents we were talking about through the lake, they transport sediment from erosion zones into deposition zones. And if you were at our webinar uh, two weeks ago, we, I showed this, this image there then as well. So this is an old image um, from the Point Clark to Goddard area. So some areas are naturally erosion zones. So erosion zones are this hash mark. Um, some areas are naturally de deposition zones. So erosion zones, the sediment gets taken away. These are a lot of bluff areas and some beach areas. Uh, deposition zones are most of the time beach areas or even um, some coastal wetlands. And then some areas are a mix of the two or they're transport zones. Uh, so it's important actually if you live along the coast to figure out what type of zone you live in Be and I'm sure <laughs> times like this with high lake levels you would automatically assume you're in an erosion zone but that might not be the case um, so the the coastal center does not have mapping about um, what zone you're in you can find this information through your local conservation authority or through the ministry of natural resources and forestry um, and that would help you just determine what kind of uh, best management practices you can apply on your shoreline in order to make sure it's resilient to change so when we're looking at the different shoreline profiles and erosion zones and deposition zones uh, we like to talk about the different coasts we have because they all have such different profiles so this is a, an example of a bluff so we have the bluff crest at the top and then the bluff face the toe of the bluff and then during times of low leg levels we usually have a, a, a beach at the base and then the shoreline but in times of high lake levels as you know um, the the water level comes up and it starts eroding the toe of this bluff now that is very normal um, Obviously, during times of high lake levels, it can be concerning, uh, and it and it can contribute to more erosion up at the top of the slope, depending on where you live, depending on the situation, depending on how much vegetation you have on the bluff face. But um, this this can be a cause of erosion, just the lake level coming up here. So when we talk about zones and bluffs, um, if you are on an erosion zone you live on the top of a bluff and you're experiencing a lot of toe erosion, um, you could automatically think, I need to harden my shoreline, uh, which is fine. That's a normal human response. Um, but we can never change what type of zone that piece of shoreline is. Um, that's just naturally how the shoreline is. It's how it will be long after we're gone as well. So you can mutate it to suit your short-term desires like hardening it like as you can see in this image from uh, the great lakes now documentary um, there was a hardened shoreline that they had here they had a, a sheet pile wall and it was undermined by the high lake levels and it still eroded their property so even if you tried to do the right thing and protect your property using hardened shoreline it doesn't guarantee that it won't stop erosion if you're in an erosion zone one of our uh, partners from the Conservation Authority, he likes to say you can't stop erosion from happening, you can only move it from one place to another. So in theory, you, like I mentioned, you can slow erosion rates using um, hardened shorelines. And you can do this through solidifying slopes with vegetation, so having deep rooting vegetation that can um, help keep all that sediment in place, intake water that's falling and act as a precipitation buffer so when rain falls on the on the shoreline those raindrops will actually erode um, erode the sediment too so having vegetation helps act, act as a buffer from above reducing loading near the slope edge is important so as you can see in this image these homes are really close so all the weight of that home is pressing on the top of the bluff and if there's a lot of toe erosion that extra weight just helps it kind of slip out um, so moving those homes back and reducing the loading near slope edges is really important. Slowing the flow of groundwater and surface water across the landscape, like I mentioned earlier with um, having wetlands and woodlands, places that can hold back water 
farther inland so it reduces the amount that's all coming out during a storm surge and using natural infrastructure to buffer so having dunes at the base of the bluff that can take a lot of the, the energy of a storm um, during low to medium lake levels will all help. Lake Ontario residence time is six years. Sorry, I'm just checking the chat here. Thank you very much, Mary Lou Louise. That's fantastic. Um, this webinar is also being recorded, so uh, you'll be able to share it with friends and family afterwards. So uh, our next shoreline profile we're going to look at is a sand beach and dune. So as you can see here, uh, there's usually the first berm closest to the water's edge and then a beach face and then a berm crest and then these primary dunes that have the dune grass and then a swale. So we have a dune, a swale, and then a secondary dune. So if you've ever had the pleasure of going to Pinery Provincial Park, um, you will know that almost from Highway 21 towards the lakeshore is all mature dune that has obviously been maturing for decades, centuries, maybe millennia, who knows? Um, but these primary dunes are usually the first ones that have dune grass, swale, and then the secondary dune will typically be an area where there will be willows or juniper, um, even bracken fern. More diversity in what can grow there because it's the secondary dune is less likely to be um, pulled away from high lake levels. So more mature vegetation can can grow in these areas. We like to say that if you're trying to rebuild a dune, it's like saving for a rainy day. It's best to do it during times of low lake levels when you have more beach to work with. So in this case, you see um, sand fencing is forming a dune closest to the house. So you form your first dune there using sand fencing. And then your second dune you form here. And then the third one you would put kind of in the middle to fill in that swale. And this is supposed to be the lake. <laughs> uh, and the lake will bring up uh, and blow up sand to help create that dune. So a cobble beach looks a little bit different than a, uh, a sand beach. And you can see a great example of a cobble beach um, on the Bruce Peninsula if you've ever gone to the grotto and kind of walked around towards Overhanging Point. There's a really amazing cobble beach there. There's one on Flower Pot Island. And there's one in uh, Godrich. Those are my three favorites, I guess. And we see here, it's a similar, similar profile. We have a berm crest with a, a small beach face, um, a, a bit of a swale or the beach scarp, a storm ridge, and then a cliff. Um, and usually at the top of these cliffs, that's where you get more graminoid species or um, like goldenrods, other ferns, um, and species that will be able to um, take the high heat from, uh, from the open canopy. So there's not usually trees uh, near a cobble beach. And then uh, we're going to look at a coastal wetland profile. So like I mentioned before, coastal wetlands are great at mediating lake level changes. So um, at the bottom of this diagram, A is a high water level of the lake. B is average and then C is a low water level. And all these different species that are emergent or are sticking out of the water or submergent that are below the water surface, um, they all rely on these lake level changes for even their reproduction. So uh, we have uh, an open lake area and then a marsh is typically with these emergent species. And then swamps have a higher canopy cover or they have more tree cover that shades the water um, and water would typically be under the surface uh, in some parts of swamps. And then lastly here we have river mouths. So like we were talking about um, rivers adding a lot of different things to our lake. Uh, you can see two examples of rivers here. This is a naturalized river mouth or one that hasn't really been changed by humans too much. It might have been dredged at one point, but pretty natural. And then here we have Bayfield Beach and it is very much um, human altered. And uh, the marina is along the lake here and then it meanders back into the inland areas over here. So, um, in these images, you can see, uh, this is Godrich now, and this is another, I think this might be Trix Creek, but I could be wrong. Um, but both of these images, if the contrast is high enough on your computer, you can see um, 
this was shortly after a rain and all, all the sediment that has eroded off the landscape enters the river or all the creeks, the tributaries enters the river and then enters Lake Huron. And I wish I had an image here to show it from an aerial perspective, but you can see as the river flows out into the lake, and we, when we have these sediment plumes is what they're called, the plume will come out kind of straight and then <laughs> take a, a sharp detour south. And that is a really good illustration of how those longshore currents um, flow along Lake Huron's um, near shore zone. So uh, whether you have a hardened shoreline river mouth or a more naturalized, uh, it doesn't tweak how much nutrients or sediment enter the lake. That is more an indication of what's happening in the river basin or even uh, the lake basin. So are there cover crops on agricultural land? Do shoreline communities have a buffer between their lawn and the water's edge? All these different things uh, make a difference as to how much is entering those rivers and ending up in Lake Huron. So, how can you go with the flow? <laughs> I mean, it's really hard for a lot of people, uh, especially those who live along the lake or and who might be in compromising positions um, to be patient as these lake levels recede. And even, I know my parents have a cottage in Tobermory. Um, there's a bedrock shoreline there. So <laughs> when that water level comes up, like they don't have a dock right now, uh, it's all underwater. So the only thing you can really do is have patience. This too shall pass. Um, like we talked about in the lake level section of this talk, um, the water level should be back down in the next six months, at least slightly. And then looking more into the long term, we could be back down at uh, our low level in another six years. So be aware that we're all feeling this pinch. We're all um, trying to do the best with what little space we have on the shoreline. And um, knowing, knowing your area's profile is, is kind of step number one into making different decisions on what you should do. Uh, so thinking ahead, if you want, wanted to put in infrastructure like a hardened shoreline, it will be a, a large investment up front and you'll have maintenance costs down the road. Um, lake levels are gonna continue to change forever, no matter how much we try and uh, engineer uh, solutions to this problem they will continue to change forever and ever. Um, so we just have to kind of work with mother nature and uh, enjoy what we have right now. And then with this in mind, making our shoreline infrastructure resilient. So um, when we talked about the, those storm events last October, all across the lakeshore from Soggy Shores to Sarnia, um, is this infrastructure in the right place? Is it gonna cost us too much to try and maintain it here? Are there other options? Should we move it back? Uh, these are things that all of our Great Lakes communities are having to deal with, especially if you've uh, been reading in the news about the community of Erie on Lake Erie. It's heartbreaking. People are losing their homes because the, the lake <laughs> has risen and taken away uh, the shoal that they were living on. So we all have to uh, consider resiliency as our number one. A best offense is a good defense, as they say. So keeping your shorelines natural is really important. Knowing your area, your ecosystem. So if you're on a coastal wetland, if you're on a coastal woodland, bedrock shoreline, um, highly erodible beach, and this will determine your risk factors. Using your ecosystems and the services that they provide to your advantage. So if you have trees that shade your house in the summer, this will reduce your heating and cooling costs and also reduce um, the impacts of wind on your house coming off the lake. Dunes have immense carbon storage opportunities, which you can learn more about in, I think, our first webinar out of this series. Um, erosion regulation, so dune grass and trees and um, all kinds of different foliage along the lakeshore help reduce erosion. And plants are known to improve our mental and physical health, even just based on the oxygen that they provide us and the different air quality. Like I know, I live down near Grand Bend and it can be stinking hot down here um, and just absolutely almost unbearable. And then I drive up to Tobermory to my parents' cottage and it's easy and breezy and the 
the air smells cleaner, it's lighter, it's not as humid, uh, and I've only driven three and a half hours. You know, it's, it's amazing how much things can change across Lake Huron's entire shoreline. So integrating nature into developments and, and developing around nature. So I was in Europe a few years ago, and it was, this was like the perfect example of different thought processes. So there was this giant tree on a boulevard. So there was the road, the pathway, and then they had built the pathway to go around this tree. So instead of cutting the tree down, just to make it easy to, to pave the walkway, they just went around it. Um, and we can do that with our development as well. Like once you cut a tree down, there's no getting that back anytime soon. It'll take 20 years for another tree to grow up as big and have all the ecosystem services that that original tree provided. So developing around nature and tweaking it so that we can still maintain all those ecosystem services is really important. And then making small adjustments around your property will, will definitely help with this too. So rainwater catchment is a super easy one. Um, or putting in a rain garden, just anything to slow the water on the surface from entering the lake quickly. Improving pollinator habitat using native vegetation. If you want to tune into our next webinar in a few weeks, um, throwing shade, I think it's called. We are talking all about different native vegetation and places that you can get native vegetation. So that'll be a great one to check out. And then growing your own food and shopping local. This all helps our um, climate change and reducing our carbon emissions and um, even just supporting our local economies. So to finish off, um, learning about your coast is the number one thing you can do. And when I say learning about your coast, I mean, that could be your physical property that you live on. It could be um, a provincial park that you go to every year religiously with your family. Just learning more about it. The ecosystem services that are provided at that ecosystem and the, the shoreline processes that, that shape that ecosystem. So our workshops are a great example of this and other reliable sources like conservation authorities or the MNRF. Sharing this information with others is great. I mean, not all of our friends or neighbors will listen, but, um, but understanding is the first step to acceptance, especially in a lot of cases that require hardened shorelines. And showing your good work, uh, you know, demonstration plots have for years been a great way for the agricultural community to um, change thought processes around cover crops, for example. So showing your good work, doing beach cleanups or reforestation efforts and being proud of these, um, you know, welcoming neighbors on to show them what you've done or just posting it on social media. Um, those are all great ways to spread the word. And then finding out about incentives. So like someone mentioned in the comments earlier, uh, there are grant programs in place for a lot of different ways to protect um, protect shorelines or protect your property and that could be as easy as just planting a windbreak on your property. Um, conservation authorities have great tree planting programs and cost recovery programs so um, definitely worth a look. Uh, in regards to that gentleman's question I don't know if there are grant programs available for hardened shorelines. I would be very surprised if there were any. I haven't heard of any anyway but uh, for improving coastal ecosystems there definitely are and coastal wetlands as well. I know that uh, Assauble Bayfield Conservation Authority has a great wetland rebuilding program and um, you can get a wetland put back onto your property for next to nothing. So it's a really great way to contribute to the overall health of Lake Huron. So that is it for me for right now. I'm gonna open it up for questions. So you can ask in the chat or the Q&A section of this webinar, um, but I, wanted to also open up some questions for you to help get this conversation started. So do you think climate change is real? <laughs> do you have a positive outlook for your community based on erosion or um, infrastructure damage that has occurred? And I will just wait to see your questions roll in here. Does the pinery continue to give away dune grass each fall? Um, I am not sure about if they do an, a specific event to give it away. Um, I haven't spoken to anyone there in the past year, so I don't know if they'll be doing it again this year or not. Um, but if you want to source dune grass, you can always either ask a local area around you, like a conservation area or provincial park or a town site, 
or a neighbor. <laughs> uh, as long as it's harvested sustainably, meaning that a whole area isn't completely cut, then it's a really great way um, to get dune grass across the shoreline. Shannon says, climate change is real and we have to act quickly. Agreed. Um, with our society, it's so challenging to do anything quickly, really. But I think that um, as we see these changes and as more people become aware and see these long-term data sets, it makes it sink in a little bit more, I think. What do you suggest about neighbors who pull out dune grass to clean their beach? This is from Shannon. Uh, that's a really great question. We see that all the time, all across the shoreline, from here in Kinloss all the way to Lambton Shores. Usually people who are pulling out the dune grass don't understand why it's there in the first place. They might view it as a weed. They might not like it because they want to put up a beach volleyball court, <laughs> which we've seen. Um, some municipalities have bylaws that will prevent um, or charge people from removing dune grass and removing dunes. I know Huron Kinloss has been working really hard uh, to encourage people to maintain their dunes because of the risk of erosion based on their shoreline profile. It's a very gradual, uh, highly erodible beach. So, um, I mean, encouraging people to learn more about dune ecosystems or telling them why dune grass is important and good and how it protects and how it's resilient. Um, that's step number one. Number two is it is telling them, you know, there's bylaws in place to protect it. These are uh, endangered species that rely on it, which are protected under the Endangered Species Act. And then if all of that doesn't work, you can always have, um, have a conservation authority come in or the municipality and look at the damage that they've done and assess whether or not uh, that a restoration, um, a restoration would be needed for that property. So in some cases in the past, the Coastal Center has actually worked with landowners to restore their property because they've taken out dune grass, they've been fined by the municipality and ordered to restore the dune. So these are very real things that occur across our shoreline all the time, um, but they're, you know, no, nobody really knows about them. And it's hard because a lot of municipalities, like six, over 6,000 kilometers of shoreline, most of Lake Huron's shoreline is actually non-erodible bedrock shoreline. So some municipalities just don't have a bylaw that says that, you know? Uh, so it's really important to check with your municipality. If you think that a bylaw like that should be put in place, talking to them about it. And um, having consistency among municipalities is important, but again, challenging because everyone's ecosystems are so different across Lake Huron's whole shore. Mary Louise, you should remind shoreline property owners that they have to be very disciplined during low levels and resist the urge to build lakeward. That's very true, <laughs> especially people who are new to the shoreline and don't realize how much our lake fluctuates. If you are in a low level like we had between 2000 and 2013, you think, oh, I got <laughs> like 30 meters of beach. This is no problem. I'm going to put up my tiki hut. I'm going to have my picnic table. I'm going to put all my boats out. And then now um, their tiki bar has, you know, been washed into the lake. Their beach volleyball court is gone. <laughs> and I'm saying all of this stuff because I've actually seen it. I've seen people be frustrated because they're the poles of their beach volleyball court are out, you know, six, seven, eight meters into the lake at this point. So you're right. And understanding that lake level fluctuation is really important. And I think that in media, like social media and, and tip, you know, regular traditional media, when, when we talk about lake levels and we say, we're 1.5 meters above average, that's a, that could sound really scary to people. Um, but knowing <laughs> that our average um, is, you know, a in the middle of a very diverse lake levels, you know, the lake fluctuates over two meters from low to high. So yes, we're 1.5 meters above average. But when you look at it in the long run, it's like, oh, okay, we're actually still in the realm of normal. So that fear mongering really needs to be toned down a bit and just being educated on it, right? James, I will gladly take the dune grass. That's fantastic. When you say, Oh, Sandy, when you say that dams are not having a drastic impact, I wonder if you could tell us how much difference it can make in approximate CMs. That's really hard to say unless you are talking about a specific system. So 
in my experience working at Algonquin Provincial Park, if we operated one stop log dam, um, so say we would see a storm coming and we would be able to estimate the amount of precipitation that we would be getting. Based on the size of the lake basin that we would have, we could say, okay, based on the amount of precipitation we're expecting, we, we think that the lake is gonna rise this much. And we, so we would pull one or two or three stop logs, allowing water to exit in preparation for that precipitation. Or on the other side, we would know, okay, we're not expecting rain for two weeks. We need to hold water back into this upper lake. So we would put one or two stop logs in to help keep that lake level either steady or raise it a little bit in preparation for that long drought. So when we're looking at Lake Huron, which has an, like a massive basin across two different countries and it's fed by two other Great Lakes, um, and you're talking about one stop log dam, <laughs> operating that and taking out one or two logs isn't going to make a huge difference. Um, I know in the news recently in, was it Michigan or Quebec or New York or something, they had a dam failure and it ended up flooding a huge amount of area downstream. Uh, we don't really have anything like at that scale on Lake Huron on the Canadian side. So I don't, I don't know that, I mean, other than Sault Ste. Marie that has the, the um, lift locks, but I, I'm not familiar enough with how they work in order to comment on them. Have concern with some residents moving forward with hard protection and impacts on lease side properties. Paul, yes. Um, if you were at our webinar a few weeks ago, we talked about lee side erosion and how some residents that put in um, a hardened shoreline in their property to try and slow the erosion. Um, like, like that quote said, you can't stop erosion, you just move it from place to place. And that's very true. So he is stopping his erosion on his property, but then it might be expediting the erosion on your property. And that is very concerning. And it's actually um, a case of, of uh, a liability for that landowner who's put in the hardened shoreline. And we have seen a lot of different litigation suits based on people expediting erosion on their property because they put a hardened shoreline on the neighbor's property. So I think it's really important for, for people to know um, that there are side effects to everything. It, there's no silver bullet. And it's, uh, we need to consider the pros and the cons moving forward. It's right now, because the lake levels are so high, we get into this mindset of um, just protect it, just do something to help us now. Like we, we, I read an article yesterday about someone saying the, the lake level needs to drop by four inches. And it's like, in order to <laughs> drop the lake specifically by four inches, I don't even know how that would be possible. There's no plug that you can pull on Lake Huron in order to make that happen. We just have to go with the flow of Lake Huron and she's going to do what she wants to do and we just have to be there and enjoy the ride. Um, what If you put a hardened shoreline on your property, um, it may or may not work. The lifespan on most hardened shorelines on Lake Huron is 20 to 25 years. So that's not a very long turnaround. Um, Marcia, it's clear that the water level is higher and it appears the scouring of the near shore has been more severe, which means we observe wave forces hitting the toe with greater force. Yes, you're right. Um, because the lake level was so low between 2000 and 2013, it actually changed the profile of our near shore zone. So that zone that's zero to six meters in depth. Um, in times where there's higher lake levels, that usually becomes more steep and helps reduce the wave energy that's approaching the shore. But when we had uh, those lower lake levels, that near shore profile went from being more steep to more gradual. So the wave energy doesn't have more of a blockade to slow it down. It's able to just rip right up onto the shoreline faster. And that's, that's because of that long-term low that we experienced between 20, 2000 and 2013. Uh, if you wanna learn more about that specifically, we have a recording from our coastal community workshops that happened this spring. It's on our coastal center website under workshops, I think. Um, it's under upcoming events and I think it's called Nearshore Workshops and the video is there. 
and um, Pete Suzak, who's a coastal engineer, he's talking about that. Robin Davidson Arnott, who's a coastal geomorphologist and is an expert on coastal processes, he also speaks on that recording as well. So definitely one to, to check out if you're more interested in learning um, about how the lake levels have affected communities in that way. Unfortunately, my, my webinar is only an hour, so I can only, you know, go so deep into it, but we have tons of resources on our Coastal Center website to check out. Um, LakeHuron.ca, you've probably been there to register for the webinar, so check out more of the resources on there. Um, and if you have more questions, you can forward them on to Coastal Center at LakeHuron.ca and I will do my best to answer them. Uh, but we have, we have a lot of information on our website too about lake levels. I think there is a thing on our events that says lake levels and we try and update it once a month. Um, right now it's been a bit crazy because it's our busiest time of year and it's just kind of fallen off the priority list for me a little bit. But in most cases we update that um, monthly and then when, when it's winter time and there's ice cover, we like to update the ice cover bi-weekly so people know what our ice cover is looking like. Okay. Janet asks, are there effects to fisheries and wildlife from rising levels? Yes, uh, like we talked about with, with coastal wetlands, um, they rely on this fluctuation of low to high. And there are definitely effects to fisheries and wildlife based on rising levels because the areas that they would go to spawn might change or they might have been developed on or they might have been scoured out. Um, in really low levels, it might be harder for different fish species to access the rivers that they traverse to get up to their spawning grounds. So if you've ever been on uh, the Sauble River in the fall, you can see the salmon and trout migration. It's absolutely amazing <laughs> to see the the fish jumping and in low levels it's even harder for them to jump up the falls because uh, because of the low lake or the low the low stream and river levels so um, high levels definitely have have an impact to fisheries populations bud says it's easy to see the damage to the soggy shores bike path by cottagers cutting down trees and shrubs that un unstructured their view, it has resulted in more severe erosion. Yes, so um, I think we talked about this a few weeks ago in one of our webinars, that a great way, if you have trees that are between you and the lake, um, instead of cutting them down, you can just cut uh, or trim, I should say trim, um, some branches away just so that you have a visage so you can see out um, while maintaining that root structure underneath and the canopy cover for different bird species and just even to give you shade and, and to provide those coastal processes, or sorry, ecosystem processes, <laughs> ecosystem services. Uh, so when we see a, a clear cutting of a, the top of a bluff or even a, a coastal forest, they will experience a significant change in their property just because they wanted a better view. So it's really important to uh, to follow tree cutting bylaws if they exist, or even just scientific um, knowledge about how that changes how that changes your shoreline. Um, they don't always give you the answers you want, but it's really important to know these things. Um, Jack Campbell, what causes a sage? Um, I have recorded this webinar, so you'll be able to tune back to it, and I explain it all there. We're just running out of time. Um, it's basically just uh, wind pushing the water from one side of the lake to the other. Um, Tim, what is the website that will show us if we are in an erosion zone? There, there's no website that I know of that I can send you to. You would have to look at your local conservation authority. I understand some areas don't have a conservation authority, so in those cases I would contact your local MNRF office, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Um, for the southern Goddard Basin, so Lambton Shores, you would be looking at um, the Elmer District Office. If you're up on the Bruce Peninsula or around Georgian Bay, uh, that would be the Owen Sound Office, I believe. And then up Sudbury has its own office as well. So depending where you are around the lake, you'd want to call your own district office. And hopefully they'd be able to send you some maps if they have them. Um, Eileen, what hardened shorelines have a 25-year life span? So um, different 
uh, studies by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Environment Climate Change Canada have looked at hardened shorelines along Lake Huron's coast and the whole Great Lakes coast, really. And they have seen that groins, the ones that are perpendicular to the shoreline, you see them a lot in Lambton County. Um, sea walls that go parallel to the shoreline that are usually um, sheet, sheet pile or sheet steel, that corrugated steel, um, and gabion baskets. They're the ones that are the metal baskets that are full of rocks. Um, those are three of many others that have been shown to have a maximum lifespan of 25 years. And we talk about that a lot in the last webinar that I did. Um, and it was recorded, it's on our website under videos, and it's on our YouTube channel. So you can uh, check that out in more, in more depth. Okay. Okay, so um, it is just after three o'clock. So I'm going to wrap up our webinar here. Like I mentioned, if you have more questions, feel free to email coastalcenter at lakehuron.ca and I'll try and get to them as quickly as I possibly can. Um, we're currently pretty swamped at the Coastal Center because of wanting to start launching our Conservation Youth Corps program, um, Green Ribbon Champion, and then Coast Watchers citizen scientists are in full swing. And um, I noticed a few of our Coast Watchers have tuned in to this webinar. So hi, hi everybody. Um, Thank you so much, um, Marcia Crockett and Dave Halpin. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, and otherwise, I will wrap it up. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and an amazing summer solstice this weekend. First day of summer is on Saturday and a great Father's Day. And um, if you want to learn more about any of our programs, just check out our website. They're all on there. And um, tune into our social media accounts as well. We have uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we like to post interesting, fun content on there every day. Uh, we also have an e-monthly newsletter that we put uh, some interesting content on every month and um, we would love to take some requests if you have anything you want to learn more about in that newsletter. So um, thank you so much everyone again and uh, I hope to see you at some of our next upcoming webinars. Okay, have a great, have a great weekend.